Hi, I'm Amanda Bulgarelli. I'm one of PAC's mentors, and I'll be guiding you through this webinar so that maybe I'll pop in to offer a little explanation, a little background, or maybe share my screen in a different way so you can see something else. Hopefully we'll answer all of your questions, or at least some of the questions. And speaking of questions, here's what we have on deck for today. The four questions we're definitely gonna to answer today is what is normal aging and what is not? Number two, what are the key signs or symptoms to look for when we're looking at early dementia? Number three, what do some of the different dementias look like? So we won't just be looking at Alzheimer's today. And number four, what can we do to help? So that's what we're gonna start with. Tipa's about to take you through a couple parts of the brain and because her screen shares um, doesn't always capture her mouse movements, I'm gonna put this picture that you've got here over top so that you can see the parts of the brain and match them up as she goes through them. So enjoy and I will be back in a little bit. So I'm gonna get started. Um, most of you might have seen me or heard me from somewhere. I'm Tipa Snow and today we're really focusing in on this idea of early signs and symptoms and how to recognize different types of dementia when you see them or hear them or experience them and then what to do about it if you do recognize what you're looking at is a is a form of dementia or if it's a form of cognitive change and it may not actually maybe it's not dementia but maybe what should you do then because that's a different situation so Many of you have looked at PET scans before if you've ever done any workshops with me or any training with me. If you have not, however, um, it might be nice to take a look at a living human brain. And that's what PET scans let us do. They let us look at brains that are alive. People are alive. They're lying in a machine. We're taking pictures of their brain. And I'll try to show you in profile the slice that we're looking at, because we're just looking at a thin slice, like a slice of bread, only it's a slice of brain. That slice goes from a right above your eyebrows, diagonally through your temples, back to your occiput, back up here, right at the, the crown. And it's a diagonal shot through the center. So I'm going to use my little, my little cursor here. This is the front of the brain up here prefrontal cortex. These are your temporal areas, temples, like right where you have your temples on your head, right here and right here. And then along the side, whoops, along the side there, that's where your brain and your body talk to each other, the sensory motor strip. That's part of a, a whole network that goes all the way up and over your head. This is a tiny little cross section of it. And then back here in the back, what you're looking at is visual cortex, what your brain can take in visually and deal with. And in these scans, just as in the next scan we'll take a look at, what we're actually able to see is how well your brain is burning fuel in order to do its work. And your brain's favorite fuel source, just so everybody knows, is sugar, glucose. Your brain thrives and loves sugar. Now, it's not the best fuel surf source, but it is your brain's absolute favorite because it gives it a quick turnaround. And so because your brain has to function so quickly, what happens is it, it uses glucose because it's fuel and then it's energy, fuel, energy, fuel, energy. And that allows it to keep going um, because it has to stop and pick up fuel and then it has to burn the fuel. And that's why glucose is that brain thing, brain fuel. Um, and your brain really gets used to it. And when it doesn't have it, this center part of the brain, this area right in here, those guys right there, those are called your amygdalae. Um, those are the most primitive part of your brain. That's the part of your brain that drives you to do things or <gasps> protects you when you feel threatened. And so the amygdalae um, crave glucose because if they can get glucose, they can do their job and they want to keep you alive and they want to keep you going. So if those amygdalae brighten up and look bright red, that means they're really active. Right now in this brain, what's really active here and here, the red areas, and back here is the visual center and the language centers and the prefrontal cortex. The person is thinking a little bit, doing some thinking, and they're just lying there. And then 
interestingly enough, these areas right here inside the temporal lobe areas, these sort of elongated things, these guys right here, and you'll see them over here as well, that's the connections in your brain, and you're seeing just a little like round, a little oval sample of it, is the wiring that goes from your thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary. It's all the mechanisms that connect the core rhythm sections in your body to your brain. So heart rate, respiratory rate, uh, suck, swallow, swallow, breathe. The idea that the engine that runs everything, uh, wake, sleep, pain recognition, the ability to recognize and fight infections, all those abilities are going through here. And if you think about that, it would make sense that these are pretty much always red because they should be on. That's what keeps you alive. If those things start turning darker colors and they aren't so red anymore, it means you're not thriving and you're starting to die. So they're really important. And then these little dots right here inside your temporal lobes, that's where your hippocampi are. Hippocampus, hippocampus. They help you learn and remember. They help you go from place to place and get back to where you started. They help you keep up with how much time has passed since you ate a meal or since you went to the bathroom or since you saw a good friend or since you took a shower. How long has it been? And it means if you keep up with the passage of time, you have a sense of when you need to do it again. So you can stay healthy, stay well, don't go sleep deprived, that kind of thing. That's, that's their function. So what we're looking at here is a 20-year-old with no brain disease and an 80-year-old with no brain disease. And the interesting thing is how much they look alike. So the tricky part is they aren't exactly the same, though. There are some differences. And one of the differences hasn't anything to do with how well your brain works. It has to do with how fast your brain works. So one of the tricky parts about knowing whether or not somebody is showing signs of just normal aging or something more is for sure paying attention to how fast they're working. And we've gotta be careful that we take away the speed thing before we look at anything else because we do slow down as we age. Uh, there's just no way for our brains and our bodies to stay as fast as they were when we peaked at 25. It's been a little bit downhill every year since then. Our metabolism slows, our uh, speed of reaction to loss of balance slows a little bit, our ability to problem solve slows a little bit. Everything slows down just a tiny bit each year. But if you look at us at age 40 compared to 25, you're likely to notice a day five compared to 40 or 80 compared to 65. Now, I'm gonna give folks a chance to take a look at these brains because this is a little different. The bottom row, like if you look the bottom row, the row across here, all of those brains were the same cross section that I showed you before. The top series is a little different. In that picture, we're looking at a cap shot. So just the slice of brain is higher. And what you notice is your brain actually folds over and goes back down toward the middle. So we see another strip of brain tissue. So this is the front of the brain, sensory motor and sensory motor, and a little bit of vision here in the back. So this was the higher picture of the brain. And I'm just gonna ask folks to take a look at these four, just these four right here on the upper one. And I said it's mostly sensation and movement, sensation and movement, it's a map of your body on your brain with a little bit of vision in the back. That little bit air there back there is related to what you see. So if that's the case and you look across here and I tell you red means it's burning bright and yellow means it's doing okay and light blue means, well, it's there, but it's not gonna be able to do anything productive without some help, but it means your brain's not dead. It, it's still alive there. And where you see purple, like I'm gonna move my cursor and you see purple tissue, but you can tell it's tissue, that's dead brain. And where you see darker purple, like if you look in here, those areas have fluid in them. There is no brain tissue in there. Those are open areas in your brain. 
So this is a normal older adult. This is somebody with early dementia. This is someone with late stage dementia. And this is an 18 month old child with nothing wrong with them other than their brain hasn't grown up yet. So I'm gonna give folks a few seconds here and I want you to tell me what you're thinking about early dementia versus normal when you see this. What do you think? Georgiana, you have any thoughts? What are you thinking? I'm unmuting. Um, well, there's definitely a notable change. Mm -hmm. um, the brain is looking, going away. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So the holes are getting a little bitter, bigger on the inside. I mean, you're seeing. Whoa, those ventricles are are getting bigger. They're enlarging, and so that's a that's a phrase you're going to hear. The, the the ventricles are enlarging. Okay. And there's brain atrophy. What else do you notice about color in this area? <clears throat> look at the, compare yeah. this to this area. When you look at the, <clears throat> the sensory motor, what you see in Eileen? It's not firing up like it's like it was. Yeah. Yeah, less so, red. A little less red, but it's still a lot of bright red. So here's where you might see it. It's more toward the vision center. And so what ends up happening is people miss important details. Right. So they're looking at stuff, but they're not scanning in an organized fashion. So when they're looking for their car keys, they look all over for their car keys, but they can't do it in a way that makes sense. And so they're becoming more and more frantic and less and less able to find the very thing they're looking for because they can't make the muscles and the skill around their eyes move in an organized, coordinated fashion. And do you think it works better when they're upset or when they're calm? Yeah, well, that was a rhetorical question. I mean, obviously, when you're calm, your your eyes and your and your movements are actually more skillful. So they'll still mostly look pretty good when they're doing okay. But if you put them in an unfamiliar environment or you stress them out with a lot of traffic on the interstate and somebody who's beeping their horn behind them and they can't find the right exit because there's a detour, cha-ching, that's when you'll see them not be able to perform. That's when you'll start to notice sensory motor wise, they'll make mistakes and they'll do things like jerk the wheel or they'll put their foot on the brake when they meant to put it on the gas or they'll, they'll not take their foot off the gas even though they want to put their foot on the brake. It's not consistent. But you can see there, there is a change. And now, here's what I want to point out to the group. When you talk to medical providers, very frequent, they'll say, well, people with dementia don't actually lose motor skills until very, very late in the disease, if at all. And what I would say is, well, I think people are missing the cues that people are changing a little bit, that they do get flustered and upset when they can't get things to work the way they want to. And it's not blatant, but we miss early cues and signals that I'm, I can't figure out the thing you want me to do. You want me to wrap my leg because I sprained it and I can't quite figure out that wrap thing. And so I wrap it the best I can, but unfortunately I cut off the circulation to my foot because I started in the wrong direction and I couldn't quite get the tension right. Or I just tell you, I'm not doing that. I can't get these stupid head hose on. They're too tight and I just can't do it. So I think what happens, my point being, actually people are indicating that they're seeing shifts and changes in their own abilities, but they don't understand. And we miss that what we might have noticed gets skipped. So now we're gonna go down here and take a little look at that second series across the bottom. So if we thought the top was a little different, look at where we see changes. And I particularly, I'm gonna ask whether you Recall what I said this little area down here was. It had to do with 
keeping people alive. Anybody sort of recall sort of some of the information about that little area right in there? The amygdala. The amygdala. Yeah, and it's your ability to recognize and react in a timely fashion to threats, to your, to your continued existence, and your ability to get your needs met. So looking at those two areas on these two brains, what is an early sign or signal that you might be experiencing some dementia? What might we see in behavior or hear, or what might be happening that seems odd to us if we were paying attention? Would, <clears throat> would there be greater anxiety because it looks, it's, you know, brighter, it's really um, firing up? Yeah, things that, things that shouldn't stir me up do. Why are you looking at me like that? Why are you bringing this up? Anybody can make a mistake. You, 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 you're acting like, you're acting like I did this. I didn't do this. Somebody else is. So what you'll see is a lot of distress behavior with minimal, minimal stimulation. So things that wouldn't have upset me before are now upsetting me. Things that I used to ask questions about, now I'm arguing about. Things that I used to pay attention to, I'm totally missing though. So I'm going out and having maybe fender benders and I'm saying, well, it's no big deal. I don't know why you're acting like this is such a big deal. Anybody can have this happen. It's not a big deal. I didn't hit anybody. So it's both sides of it. I'm both more impulsive, but I, at the same time, miss threats that are threats and see threats where there aren't any. So it may impact our relationship. It may impact, let's say, mm, I'm borderline diabetic and I start to have dementia. Somebody want to give me a guess about what my amygdala would try to get me to do? Eat more sugar. Yeah. And then when I eat it, um, if you're my partner or supervisor and you notice, what I'm going to do is say, well, I didn't do that. And you're going to go, you did too. And it was like, well, it was one candy bar. It was not one kid. This is where... <laughs> my brain actually will work for me and say, no, 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 I just had one bite. I just had one bowl of ice cream. The, 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 the whole gallon's gone. Well, I don't know what happened to it because if we take a look, these other guys, these hippocampi, which is my learn and remember thing, guess what's happened to it? Well, these guys are getting bossy. So I have less ability to hold on to detail and more desire to get what I want and avoid what I don't. I, I don't think it's okay. I don't want to do it. So what are some personal, personal interaction things you might, without thinking, what would you say about people who are more impulsive, um, less responsive, more feeling threatened by things that aren't you, you didn't do anything. You didn't mean anything. What are some words you could think might come to mind? And then when you try to say something, you'll get, I, that's not true. I don't know where you came up with that, that I've never done stuff like that. What are some words you might use? Your favorite would be, don't you remember? That's what we're going to want to say. Now, don't tell me you didn't do that. Look at the, look at the, look at the papers. Well, I don't do that. You did too. Don't, I mean, how, ah, ah. so do you think we would call them resistive? Combative. Combative. Mm. Argumentative. Uh, how about she's in denial? How about um, non-compliant? How about self-destructive? How about paranoid? How about, so the reason I'm bringing all these words up, very frequently early signs of dementia get misidentified as personality or, or personal behavior kinds of things, when in fact, what they are clearly are is evidence of brain change. 
But if people are not thinking brain change, then they tend to think of other situations where that might be the case. So what we want to keep in mind is we will slow down, but we won't change function unless something's going wrong. Okay, so I'm back. So she just answered question number one. So I'm going to take you through that piece right now. So question number one was, what is normal aging and what is not? So basically, in a nutshell, everybody slows down in processing time. It's just part of normal aging. Judgment and reasoning should stay about the same. We should be able to make good judgments and stay as reasonable as we, as we always have been. Our function in our bodies, unless there's something broken or something acute, should still pretty much be the same, but slower. Um, and then forgetful. Forgetfulness is a big piece that we hear about a lot. It's normal aging to be forgetful. She'll talk in just a minute about what's not normal. But normal aging, forgetful, does not equal dementia. And the tricky part is there's lots of old words out there that show us that people don't get this. Okay, so I'm going to give you some of the words that have been floating around for a long time about older adults. Well, she's getting senile. Well, she's got the hardening of the arteries. She's crazy. Well, I'm going to tell you something. She just didn't write. That one's stubborn and ornery. She's losing it. Well, you know, that's just getting old. That's what old people do. She's not trying. She's more forgetful. Well, you know, at least she's just pleasantly confused. And I have yet to meet anybody who goes confused who felt it was pleasant. So I want us to realize that the general public and the medical community still has a lot of bias against noticing signs of not normal aging and assigning it an emotional reaction or assigning it the idea that, well, you know, that's just aging or that's dementia without carefully checking it out. And what we know is there are patterns, and the patterns will involve one of four major categories. Issues with memory, issues with word finding, issues with problem solving, or issues with behavior. And then I'm going to add a fifth that everybody forgets, issues with vision. So in this piece, Tifa talked about vision changes and how it's normal to lose some vision but not the way that we lose it with dementia. So at 75, normal aging, we will lose about 45% of our peripheral vision. With dementia, there's something different. Even early on, we get what's called scuba or tunnel vision. Um, not that we can't see, but we can't process all of the information coming in through our eyes. So what we actually lose is a decent amount of peripheral vision so we can actually only see, if you put your arms out in front of you, um, about a yardstick's worth, or a meter stick, um, of a circle in front of you for your curiosity, your safety awareness, your ability to take in and process that data. So that's the first change that we really see when it comes to dementia, as opposed to normal aging, where I lose only about 45%. If you'd like to try it out, your hands can go up like this, and you can take a look around. And then with early dementia, we're talking about tunnel vision. So your hands close down and that's what you're able to take in. So there's a big difference there. People skip vision. And vision is really critical in getting in data, processing data, and making good choices about what you process. So I'm going to show you this laundry list that currently exists um, that was designed to identify signals and signs of early Alzheimer's. And I want to be clear that this was initially brought into play when we were worried about Alzheimer's and we truly did believe that about 80 to 90 percent of all dementias were going to be Alzheimer's. And so the whole list was designed to identify symptoms of early Alzheimer's. 
it is not designed to identify symptoms of many other dementias. And therefore, it's critical that we keep this for what it is, which is an identifier for Alzheimer's and some other dementias. But there are, there are different dementias where these will not be your first symptoms. So we've got to be careful. So this is a aid, but not a, a go-to. This is just something to keep in mind. So problems with recent or new information, difficulty doing familiar but difficult tasks, problems with word finding, particularly misnaming or misunderstanding what you've told them or said, getting confused about time and place and getting lost, particularly with driving or appointments, um, judgment not being where it should be, difficulty with problem solving and reasoning, misplacing things, putting them in odd places and accusing, accusing others of having done it, uh, changes in mood and behavior, like I described, where I, you have this high, high velocity or frustration with everything or anxiety, changes in personality and loss of initiation. So the thing is that people could have some of these and not all of these and because I might have had tendencies towards some of these things over time, people will totally miss that this has now converted from something where it's a mood disorder to it is now a brain failure condition. So having said, those are some common symptom profiles. Sometimes the, what we're looking at is another form of dementia. Sometimes it's a health condition that's not being managed. Sometimes it's medications effects, side effects, interactions. Sometimes it's just hearing loss that's not being addressed or changes in vision that people are misperceiving, depression, delirium, or pain-related behaviors that people are not noticing. Hi, so this part, Tifa's talking about changes related to medications to be aware of. More of a delirium that you might see, or it could be a prolonged change. Some of the other things she mentioned in the PowerPoint, delirium, of course, depression, anxiety, long-term stress, and there are lots of other possibilities that it could be that mean not normal aging, but don't necessarily mean dementia. It's important to really check out the possibilities before jumping to that conclusion. But now she's going to tell you a little bit about medications that might appear to cause symptoms that could be dementia. So what we're going to do now is I'm actually going to take you through and I'm going to these slides are in here, and if you want to take a look at them, one of the slides I have in here is medications people might be on. And the reason I put this laundry list in here from the Washington Manual of Geriatrics is that there are medications within these categories that will give people symptoms of having dementia, but what they have is a medication interaction. But if they've been on the meds a while, nobody thinks to look at the medications, but it's the aspect of aging with medications and toxicity or interactions that you didn't used to have. And particularly of note is anything with Benadryl in it. Benadryl reduces the availability of acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is what allows your hippocampal areas to do their thing and create new memory. And so it makes you foggy and groggy and have a hard time holding on to things. So an example of that is trade name Tylenol PM because Tylenol PM uses Benadryl to help you go to sleep. Unfortunately, it also gives you a hangover and leaves your brain short on acetylcholine. So if I could at 55 take Tylenol PM for my arthritis pain without any problem, when I get to 70, I don't realize what everybody is thinking is dementia is actually a toxicity due to my use of Tylenol PM and actually could be managed differently. Um, there's also medications some women get, particularly that are high risk, that are for gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, but I can't make it to the bathroom in time, urge incontinence. Some of the older medications that were designed for that reduce acetylcholine availability. And the reason they do that is it keeps your bladder from being so active. But unfortunately, it also affects your brain. 
So now you neither can get to the bathroom on time nor figure out where it is. So I'm not sure that's a particularly helpful intervention, but nobody goes back and evaluates, did it work? And even more importantly, they never did a cognitive assessment before they started. So we didn't know that your cognition went downhill along with your bladder not getting any better. So one of the messages I want the group to think about is who do you think when we start putting these meds in place by, by prescription, might I add, who goes around and does a cognitive screening to determine your baseline so that when you're on these over time, we know whether or not these things in and of themselves might be affecting your thinking. So, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and ask around. How many of you think that there is a pattern, consistent pattern, when we prescribe these, when these meds are prescribed, that we get a baseline on cognition and we follow through every six months to a year, we're doing a follow-up cognitive screen just to make sure nothing's going off on the cognition since we've got you on these meds. What do you think the percent of um, uh, practices that do that are? Very low. It's not happening. Maybe some really good ARNPs in facilities are doing that, but otherwise it's rarely happening. Yes. Your best chance of having a screening done episodically is to live in a residential program where you have other health problems and they're monitoring you for other reasons. In practice, this is not done. Zero. People who are put on these medications are not, as a rule, even though they're older and we know these are risk medications, are not given a baseline and then monitored. Although we wouldn't dream of giving these meds and not monitoring blood pressure or monitoring weight or monitoring other things. I mean, it's an interesting phenomenon that we worry a lot about cognition, but we don't actually do much to monitor people's well-being cognitively until we see something really going wrong and that's when we get all upset and jump around and we've got to do something I've got to get mom in there we've got to get her evaluated but we have all these opportunities to do baselines and yet they're rarely done so we often miss early opportunities to make a difference even in the medications that people are taking so I just point that out because when we have a team I'm wondering what responsibilities we could take to say, hmm, I'm wondering if it's worth doing a baseline on cognition since we're starting some new meds. And to advocate for people rather than just assume physician knows best, medical provider will obviously do what needs to be done for the best interests of the people they're serving. Because people get busy and they're just not thinking. They're they're assuming that they're giving the med for a heart condition, so it will treat the heart condition, but they've got a little problem with their own vision. So it's just a thought, the value of a team. When we're working in teams, we have the possibility of somebody taking a step back when somebody else is getting close on an investigation and being curious about the possibility of, you know, once we started that med, I'm starting to notice her really struggling with doing things that she didn't used to have trouble with. Because if we let it go on long enough and people get into a new habit of behavior, it's much harder to grow new synaptic connections than to sustain the ones we have. So let me go back. And we'll do a little more investigation because what I'm going to do is offer to let you guys take a look at an umbrella. So I'm going to bring the umbrella up. This information is all there and we can go back and look at screening in a little bit. Here's what I want you to do though. I'm going to have you look at the umbrella and then what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you which dementia I'm role-playing with Amanda. Okay, and we're just finding out what your baseline abilities are. Okay, so there's question number two that she just answered. I'm just gonna pull it up. 
So what are the key signs or symptoms for dementia? We're talking about a dementia that we're looking at. Again, we're looking in significant changes in the ability to do things that I used to be able to do. Changes in judgment, reasoning, and problem solving abilities. Big changes in memory. Big changes in word finding. I'm struggling to find certain words, particularly nouns, but it could be other words. Or a change in my speech pattern that's really noticeable. Changes in my behavior. And changes, as we talked about before, in vision. Okay, so you're about to watch some role plays that are gonna set up question number three. What do the different dimensions look like? And I'm gonna be the role play partner for Tifa, and you're gonna get to see her playing out some of the different dementias in the early stages that you'd be looking at some of the symptoms. So make sure you keep an eye on her, but notice my ability to be Sapphire really shifts throughout the different role plays. I start out pretty, pretty confident and I'm repeating her words and I'm really trying to validate and then I sort of get caught up in what? And confusion kicks in. So we're looking here to see some of those symptoms and signals that we might miss completely because we didn't realize that there was something different going on. That's all it is. And then we're going to go in and I'm going to talk some about these different dimensions and then we'll come back to this again. So once I give you some role play, we're going to ask you what symptoms you notice first. What did you notice? What did you notice me doing? What did you notice me not doing? those kind of things. And we'll just take a couple minutes for role play. You have your, your careful ears and eyes on, and then we'll ask you about what you noticed and see if we can identify which dementia you think I might be exhibiting. Okay. Ready, Amanda? Hey, listen, I, I wanted to ask you something. Yeah, Tipa, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. Now you live two houses over, right? Well, yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's this man and he keeps coming around. Now, has he been looking in your windows because at night there's a comes, man? Yeah. Yeah. Now he hasn't, he, he, he sort of taps a little on the window, but he looks in and he never says anything and he, and he's looking. Have you, have you called the police? That doesn't sound safe. Is well, he? I mean, I don't, I didn't know if he's a guy that's like, he's sort of familiar. I feel like I, I sort of know him, but I can't place him. And I didn't know, have you had him, ha has he been at your house? No, no. I mean, I hope not. I don't, I don't. Th well, he never I mean, does anything. I mean, he, he's just, he's an old guy. Um, You're and not talking talks. about your husband, are you? No, 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 not him. He's in the house. No, this is some guy that's looking in the windows, and he comes are, up, and you try. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, and, it, and it's in the, in the evening, mostly. And, and, uh -huh. and, and it, he comes. Now, listen, they're, they're, they've, been, they've been also the people that come around, you know, and they... They give things. They the guy well, the that in the mailman has been coming. Yeah, the mailman. That's who it is. Yeah. The guy who puts the things in the thing. Yeah, he was. He came and he knocked at the door because there was a box. Right. But the box, I the, I didn't order anything, and so I decided that I wasn't going to get it because see the box. I'm I'm concerned that the guy with the box they have a plan. Well, you think the guy, the, but the the guy that's looking in your window is uh, right. I, the, we I don't know who he is, but I know I know him. Do you? Could he send me something? Could he be sending me something? Well, yeah. I mean, people, you don't have to order something for it to come in the mail. Well, but I'm not going to really eat something about. somebody sends because you know they that that's not safe. Well, no, it's not safe to have okay, somebody so looking I'll in your window. There. <laughs> Now you got me all stressed out. I don't know. <laughs> all right. So we'll pause for a second. And I'm going to ask you guys, what kind of things did you notice? What were you picking up on? Paranoia. So I was concerned. I, I was worried mm -hmm. about things. Mm hmm Yeah. It was interesting you chose that word, Jordiana. Why, as opposed to Tipa was worried. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, yes. So uh, in hallucinations, you're seeing the man. Well, you don't know that it's a hallucination. Why did you think it was a hallucination? Uh, okay. There could have been some old guy outside my window. For our purposes today, maybe you should have made it a monkey or something. <laughs> Maybe, but, you know, in this case, there was some old guy. Okay. What else? What else did y'all notice? So I am, I'm seeing an old guy several times. It's right. not once, by the way. I'm seeing him multiple times. Right. And what else did you notice? Um, there, there was no audio or physical um connection it, it this ah. one was just visual it seemed like yeah so i he wouldn't talk he didn't talk and he wasn't trying to get in maybe some tapping but that was about it he just looks he just looks he's not he's not doing anything physical but looking except this package business so these this package came and i didn't order it and this guy is outside my house, and my brain put the two things together and came up with an explanation of he probably sent the package, but I'm not eating it. Don't try. What else it. did you notice? He doesn't seem to be really afraid or scared. He's yeah. just, you know, he's he's saying what he's saying. He doesn't seem to be like he's worried about being harmed. I'm not worried about being harmed. Yeah, no. So I'm, I'm curious though. I'm very curious about the situation. And what did I do? I was so curious. What did I do? You reached out to ask Amanda. Yeah, she, I, I'm communicating about my concern. So mm -hmm. I'm not, um, I actually think it's real enough that, I mean, for me, it's real enough that I, I'm worried. I'm not worried exactly, sort of, but not too much. I wanted to check it out with Manda. Is she having a similar experience? Is there some old guy coming around outside her house too? What else did you notice? And, and the visual thing sort of makes it hard for you to remember some of the other things I was doing, I suspect. The where they the guy that comes and he puts the thing in the um they put the thing in the thing the um word finding word finding oh so I was having a little word finding specifics nouns I couldn't think of and I stuttered and stumbled there a little bit um and I told the emotional thing over and over and I sort of got in a loop on it and then I would move away from it. Did I want her to call authorities? Nope. I don't want to get I don't want to get the authorities involved in this. I want a friend to check this out with me is what I'm looking at. Um so I don't really want to go up. I want to go over because I don't want people who maybe are more in an authority position to be making judgments about me. I'm a little nervous about whether or not what I'm experiencing is legit or not. And I don't, I don't want to go into the official thing because I'm afraid it might not be. Okay. So, Anything else you noticed? When does it happen? Evening, at night, yeah. Yeah, so who in this group is familiar enough with the different dementias? You think you might be willing to guess which this one is. Anybody wanna make a guess on it? Go ahead, Eileen. Could it be uh, um, uh, frontal lobe? Um, F, uh, no, I'm sorry, Louis body. Louis body. Okay. That's what you're thinking. So let me go ahead and show you some symptoms of Louis body. And let's see if you think maybe those things, some of those things might be true. So this laundry list, just so you know, are called the keys of Louis body. And so if you have five of these, five of these things showing you have probable Louis body. So some things would be movement problems and falls. The second one is visual disturbances or hallucinations involving animals, children, or people. 
fine motor problems involving your hands or your mouth. Episodes of rigidity or syncope. Syncope means your blood pressure drops, your heart rate drops, and you can pass out or fall down. Um, and then you come back. Nightmares or insomnia. Delusional thinking. Fluctuations in ability. And drug reactions or responses that are extreme or strange. So, when you look at that whole laundry list and you listen to what just happened, what do you think most people, not this group, but most individuals might think was going on with me? Do you think they would think dementia or would you think they might think mental health or delirium? Yeah. And so what happens from the very beginning is people misperceive my condition because those symptoms are more associated with schizophrenia. They're more associated with a delirium that comes from dehydration or malnutrition or alcohol abuse or use. And so what happens is people put me in a different category from the outset because what they notice are the visual disturbances and the thinking disturbance, but that is being caused by these Lewy bodies, these abnormal growths on the cortex and deep inside my brain. So what would be your next screening, screening, trying to figure out, does she have any other signals or symptoms? Is there anything else that maybe I want to explore with her? And your job is to give what you think to Amanda, because we want to do a little more work before we share what we heard with someone. Because if we just share hallucinations and delusional thinking, it's not going to help them in general think broadly of the possibility of dementia. What it tends to do is drive people immediately into a psychiatric thinking mode. So our job as a team is to say, okay, what more do we need to find out before we start moving forward with, okay, so this is what we should do. What else do we want to try to scope out? And we'll use Manda as the person who will try to figure this out in an interaction with me. So you guys talk with Amanda and, and get some ideas out there. What do you think might be important for her to try to ask me about or check out with me, given those other symptoms that you saw on that list. Well, yeah, I'm thinking about movement problems, like has he had many falls? Okay, cool, so problems with movement. Have there been any falls, any concerns about mobility? Right. Okay, great, mm -hmm. what else? Hmm. How about sleep? Want to want to sort of scope yeah. out? You know, have you seen any difference in sleep? Nightmares. Like has he nightmares? Had any, has uh -huh. he had any disturbing nightmares? Has anything? Have you had any at night? Has anything weird happened at night? Yeah. Now, here's the tricky thing with Louis Body. People don't actually they they're not actually asleep asleep immobile asleep they're up and moving and so what they what you may want to ask is has anything weird happened around the house at night have you had any weird experiences like people doing things or things happening that seem really odd around the house because with nightmares people who have Louis body they frequently the dreams aren't dreams they're real events they they don't their brain doesn't see them as a dreaming state. Their brain views them as a live state. It's something that actually happened. What else might you check out? Marion mentioned new medications or fluctuations. Good. So, you know, wondering if, if she, Tipa has gotten any new meds. Maybe there's a new medication on board that... So, in this moment with Manda talking to me, do I seem to be able to have a conversation? Am I answering Manda's questions? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, so this is the thing about Louie body. This conversation I'm having, 
which in one way you look at and go, gosh, she's totally illogical. I mean, this, but I'm logically illogical. I am able to interact and give you information. It's not like I'm not here. I am, but it isn't quite right. I'm not quite right. And I may or may not know that. In this case, I know something's funky, but I can't quite put my finger on what it is. So what do you think you want to ask Manda to check out? What, what particular things, do, what do you want her to find out for you before we go to try to figure out who are we going to talk to about this? Because Manda mentioned my husband's here. Mm. What do you think? <clears throat> Well, you're going to have to have a conversation with him um, and see what I... Do you want to have a conversation with him without my permission? No. <laughs> no. Because then everybody's ganging up on me and yeah. nobody's on my side. So... <laughs> I, I'd go to the charts. I'd go to well, the there's charts. no chart right. where she's just a next door neighbor. Oh, right. Forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Louis body is not going to show up at your clinic. No. Because frequently people who have Louis body are nervous because I'm smart enough to know that I sound like a psych case and I'm going to be real careful about wanting to bring this up with people in authority because I don't want to get put somewhere and labeled as something that I'm, I, I, I think there's this guy, I mean, uh, I really do think this, and I know it might sound illogical. That's why I went to the neighbor rather than trying to seek out somebody who's in an official capacity. So if you were a team, trust me, I probably am not going to bring it up with a primary practicing physician. I may bring it up with the CNA, or I might mention it to the speech person or the person in the dining room, or I, if I'm, I'm trying to figure this out and I'm an more of an extrovert than an introvert. I want some feedback, but I don't want to get caught for obvious reasons. So anybody have some specific ideas that Manda, yeah. you want her to check out? Do you want to check out my sleep pattern? You want to check out my meds? Uh, any falls? Any, any changes in balance and coordination lately? Anything else? Hmm. And you said dream state, um, nightmares. Let's just right. see what happens when man checks those out. So uh, t the guy that, uh, yeah. I mean, you said it's happening only at nighttime? Well, yeah, I've only ever seen him at night, but I haven't, I mean, you, you, no, I, I just at night. It's just, that, you know, when the curtains and it's like, it's not all the time. I see him first sort of walking and then he'll look every night. Are you sleeping first and then you wake up and no, see? No, 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 no. it's before bedtime. It's, it's sort of, um, you know, I'm, I'm not big on TV. So it, but um, it's, it's, it's shortly after the news. It's always shortly after the news. Which, I'll, which news would you say five o'clock or like the 11 o'clock news? No, no, not 11. No, that's too late. I don't do it. Not then. Um, I have other things. I'm working on things. I've got lots of things I'm working on at night. Oh. You know, I, I watch the news at six six o'clock i think it's six o'clock news the so six o'clock to okay. seven six to seven and it's 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 like after um what is it Je Je jeopardy after jeopardy after i watch jeopardy then this guy that's when he shows up but then uh -huh. but then i start working on the computer and he and then i don't see him again and and, and i work on the computer and I'm, I'm trying to get things done and and, and so you're and working then, on the computer are you working on the computer until late late well, there's, I've, I've got it i i work on the computer but then i then i need to go 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 and and then i go in the other place in there and that and then i come back now are are you eating dinner at any point are you eating food or kumquats i eat kumquats because um, kumquats, kumquats have a special flavor. And, and are you eating anything? Fact, no, shut else? up for a second. I don't mean to be rude, but I'm trying to tell you about the value of them. There's, yes. there, there, there are certain things that when you eat them, they give you more nutrition than people realize. Sure. 
Okay, so the kumquats, are you eating them with something else or just? No, the no, no, just kumquats. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it, what is your husband eating? Is he eating the same thing or? No, he won't eat them. He says th that I should be eating other things, but that's because he, he has, uh, he's, he's been involved in other things lately and I don't know what all they are, but he comes and he goes. And when he goes away, then he comes back and I'm not sure what he's been up to, but you know, then he, then he, then he's had other things. Uh huh. Okay. So, Okay, so we'll pause here. <laughs> so the more we're trying to get more details, what is happening? It is kumquat season, you know. I'm just <laughs> out there. I, I made Eddie get me a bag of it before he leaves for Hong Kong. <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so um, lest you all think I make this stuff up, um, Warren, do you want to tell them sort of a little bit about yourself? Um, I really like kumquats. <laughs> it's kumquat season, and that's all that I'm focused on right now. Sorry. <laughs> so, Lauren, do you have any health conditions that might be of interest to people? Uh, um, Louie body would probably be one, I'm guessing. <laughs> Yeah, so Lauren lives with Lewy body disease, and one of her very first conversations with me involved a lot of kumquats. Um, and, and early on, I mean, this story that I'm telling you uh, is actually based loosely on the real story that Lauren and I had to work through because she was actually fairly terrified to have medical providers involved in this. She knew something was really not right, but at first, it was really scary to have people thinking, because her background in geropsychiatric nursing is sort of such that you don't want to be talking about this stuff with people who um, are going to start putting labels on things until you figure out what's going on a little bit. And so the interesting things of, of what you see and what's happening, that's Lewy body disease. So this whole phenomena of trying to figure things out, it does get a little complicated and frustrating. The most important thing is, however, that most of the medications that were initially used with Lauren to try to help her manage stuff turned out to be not very helpful medications and actually made things much worse. Um, with both movement, Lauren became unable to move, she couldn't speak, um, and it was because people were using medications to try to help with hallucinations, not in a very helpful way. So what I'm trying to point out is the stuff that I was playing around with, and it seemed extreme, actually, unfortunately, are often early episodes of Lewy body disease. And because it's so misunderstood and misperceived, people are very hesitant to talk about what they're experiencing in detail because people react as though they have a psychiatric condition and immediately move them into that model. And that's not helpful. So do folks have any thoughts or ideas when we talk about Lewy body? Because that's, that's sort of a possible profile of somebody with Lewy body. It could be falls instead, but very frequently it's visual and nighttime wakefulness and um, dream states that seem quite real and seem like things are really happening when they weren't. They were dreams, but you don't know that when you're having them. All right. Well, that was our Louie body experience. So let's go and let's check out another dementia. So I will now go back to the umbrella. So just to show you, we've got Alzheimer's, we've got vascular, we've got frontal temporal dementias, uh, and then we have a whole laundry list of others. I'm going to do a second one, just let you preview all the words here, and then we'll, we'll put Manda back to work again. Okay, so, so I, um, hey, Tifa. Hey. Is everything okay? Y yeah, I, I, I want it, I want to, I, there's a, there's a sick, sit, 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 s
there's a there's a problem that I need to I want to want to do you want to write it down for me Tifa I'm having a hard time write it down um, um I yeah um the uh, the um Oh, I can't think of the um, a problem with your house or no, not at not not the house. It's not the house. It, it's it's mm -hmm. other the um, oh, it's it's the the um, the the where you go, where you go, the go in the car, the car, the car. It's the car. You're having a car problem. Should I call my husband? Huh? I'm going to call my husband for help. Call your husband. Is your car stuck somewhere? No, 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 no. It's not, it's not, it's not stuck. It's, it's, I can't, um, the, I, I, it, it got, it got, um, it got, it, the, um. Hit? You hit it on something? No, 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 not hit, not it hit. It, it didn't, no, I didn't hit it. It, it, I don't know. I was gonna go with the with the mechanism Tifa, i've really got to get going this is i don't know what else i can do for you okay we'll pause um okay so what did you all notice <laughs> the word finding wasn't really able to pull that word out wasn't able to get the expression done to complete yeah. the thought it do I like, seem do I seem to have something I want to talk about? Yes, but just not able to pull the thoughts together to be able to say what the expressions, the thought, the words weren't there, the the um, the ability to verbalize and process the thought was you, you could see it going the, on. You could see me trying to right. figure out a way to get it across. Right. Did I use my hands really skillfully? No. No. I'm also struggling. Did I use both my hands, though? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I have bilateral. Did right. you see any drooping or notice anything from one side to the other of my face or my body so far? No. 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 Do I have, is my emotion up or down? Well, right now it's up. There's it's no, up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and do I have a desire to communicate? Oh, absolutely. Do I know who I'm communicating with? Um, I'm not sure. No. Okay, okay, because I couldn't get her name out, but I'm right. making a lot of eye contact and I'm pausing. Am I waiting for her to say something and then trying to get what she says and try to use what she says? Right, right, yeah. Right. Can I come up with what the next thing is? Um, no, no. So am I having a little trouble with sequencing? sequencing Not just yes. verbal sequencing, yes. but task yes. sequencing. Right. So you're not able to initiate. You're not able to sequence. Am um, I trying to do yes. that? Yes. But yes. I can't seem to get it going. No. And yet I know what I, I know something that I'm trying to communicate. Right. And it's a need. Um, but I don't want her husband involved somehow. Right. And, and the, uh, the, okay. So of the different dementias, which ballparks might we be in? You want to look at the umbrella again, or you got it? I think it's frontal temporal, or the FTD. You think it's some type of frontal temporal? Yes. Okay. Anybody else have a different? Okay, Marion was thinking maybe Alzheimer's or maybe some mixed dementia. Yeah. Okay, let's go take a look at FTD to start with, since Eileen, that was your idea. Let's go look at our symptoms of FTD and let's look at a couple different variations of FTD and see what happens when we look at those to see if that might jog anything and it makes us think along that line. Okay, so there's lots of variations. Um, so we might have more uh, impulse and behavior loss of control issue, or we might have more of a temporal lobe language loss. Um, and one of the hallmarks of that is you can't speak or you can't get the words out, or, and you can't understand what somebody says, but you sound fluent, but it's nonsense. Okay, now on the frontal, there's 
says unexpected, rude, mean, odd things to others, disinhibited about food, drink, sex, emotions, or actions, or more of an OCD type behavior, which is sort of an obsessive sort of not able to let go of something, got to get it fixed, got to figure it out, repeat it until you can get your head around it, or hyperorality, which means things go in my mouth, things go in my mouth. Okay. So those are the ballparks. And under that, there are five variations. Okay. We have a frontal variant, frontal temporal. We have a frontal temporal dementia. Then we have a temporal lobe non-fluent. Then we have a temporal lobe fluent. And then we have this chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which some people put in this category and some people put elsewhere. So the frontal variant FTD has a combination, and these are the classic sort of combo of symptoms that lead us to believe it might be an FTD that's a frontal variant. Misbehavior, impulsivity, disinhibition, inertia, OCD behaviors, inattention, lack of social awareness, lack of social sensitivity, lack of personal hygiene, becomes sexually overactive or even somewhat aggressive, becomes rigid in thinking, has stereotypic behaviors, um, is manipulative. Now, manipulative, not socially manipulative, but manipulative of objects, physically manipulates things, just manipulates and manipulates and, and uses hands and fingers. Hyperorality, stuff around the mouth. Language may be impulsive, but not affected or reduced or repetitive. So do you, are you thinking it's this one? No. Yeah, no. Okay, then we have pit, 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 pit disease. Um, and PICS is, is a combination of fr temporal, frontal and temporal, poor decision-making, problems with sequencing, reduced social skills, lack of self-awareness, hyperorality, egocentric, disinhibited, OCD, excessive emotions, combined with reduced attempts to talk, reduced content in speech, poor volume control, uh, public use of forbidden words, sing song speech, and can't understand others' words. Um, in moments, someone who has Pick's disease looks like they have Tourette's. Ooh. Okay, that's one of those sort of like has moments of Tourette's like symptoms. Not, is that one? That one, did I do that one? No. <clears throat> yeah, no. no. All right, so then what we have is a non-fluent aphasia. Can't name things, hesitant speech. Some people actually don't speak. Worsening of speech production over time, echolalia. Over in, and in, and in, and in, and it, and it, and it, and it, and uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cookie, cookie, cook, cookie, not cookie, cookie, cookie. <sighs> Not, not cookie. It's not not the cookie. It's the other. It's the other. It's the other. Okay. Misspeaking, word salad, receptive inability for some people. Other skills are intact fairly early, and twenty five percent never develop global dementia, but seventy five percent do. Wow. And the next place it will go is into the prefrontal cortex with sequencing and the ability to initiate most likely with a fluent aphasia smooth delivery but more not hey me um, Amel, amelia listen you know that phenomena that we were looking at with the cadillacs well that is the one you know that cadillac that one that that's where the phenomenological issue is with the cadillacs and the in this triggers the triggers are the one that will result in it and that's why it was it was really really remarkable and i just wanted to point out the thing the thing of all of it the remarkable element of this whole situation is the thing which you would say and then you don't even know what it is <laughs> that's george bush <laughs> very nice tifa yeah, thank you it's my skill so <laughs> so what happens in this one is you're just like your brain is your brain not my brain your brain is going right it, it, there's words in there what is it what is she saying because it's the words are there but the sense behind the words it's it's words strung together with nice 
nice fluidity and it's just your brain just gets so stunned you're like and so you say things really dumb things like I have no idea what you just said, Tipa. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's like, well, I said the phenomenon. What, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you get? What do you got? That you can't even hang on to the articulation of it. <laughs> so of those kinds of conditions, and I could do the uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, this typically I will have had repeated head injuries or concussions. Um, the symptoms are frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and rapid progression into an Alzheimer's-like pattern. Um, or sometimes frontal, uh, very rapid progression into FTD patterns with death uh, relatively within a few years. So it's a, the encephalopathy is a very rapid progression. Um, and it's a little different. So of all the ones we went over so far, which one do you think is your best probable here? Hmm. If you had to guess. The non-affluent aphasia? Yeah. The non-fluent aphasia. I at least have some non-fluent aphasia, for sure. Because yeah. my language is so impaired and yet my thinking is better than my language. But I have some frontal lobe now starting to develop as well. So I'm one of the, possibly the FTDs, the temporal lobe, who's starting to progress into full dementia. So I started with a primary progressive aphasia, but now it's moving forward in that I get stuck physically. It's not like I can't do things, but I can't sequence things. So one time when I go to make the coffee, I forget to put the pot in. And then the next time I don't put any water in. And then the third time I don't even do the coffee. I go to the kitchen and I eat a sandwich. Um, and yet I don't understand why that's a problem for you because I'm doing the best I can. Um, and I'm stuck. So some days I'll be able to drive a motor vehicle. <laughs> and sometimes I'll get in the car which is what I was really trying to tell Manda is I couldn't figure out how to turn the key on. That I, I, I couldn't make the car go. And I know how to go, but I couldn't get the, I, I couldn't remember what, it, what do you do to make the car go? But I couldn't get all those words out, but I was out in the car. And so I came back in to try to figure out how to get the car to go. What didn't I do, which would have been a logical thing to do, but because now my frontal cortex is starting to be involved, what didn't I do with Amanda that would have been the logical thing to do? Ooh. What could I have done that would have helped her understand what I was talking about? Taking her out to the car. Oh, taking her out to the car. Yeah. 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 It, that link yeah. between if I'm trying to communicate and I'm stuck with language, switch gears and go to an action, take yeah. Manda where the task is, it doesn't occur to me to switch gears like that. So now she just answered question number three. Now it was a long answer, so I'm going to really try to sum it up in a few short words. Her PowerPoints obviously have more detail on each of the types of dementia, but here we go. So what do some of the different dementias look like, especially early on, when we might miss a lot of the signs and symptoms? Lewy body, we talked about motor problems, meaning how we move, sleep issues that might not have been noticeable, but as you put it all together, you're starting to realize, oh, there's a lot of different things here. Hallucinations or delusions, um, which require a little digging because some of them may be accurate and some of them may not be. And the story around it that my mind builds is called confabulation. And so sometimes they are accurate and they're real stories, but maybe it didn't happen how I'm thinking it happened. Um, and there's also potentially problems with word fighting. So that was Lewy body. Temporal lobe, she demonstrated two different ones here, non-fluent aphasia, which is that halted speech, word finding really was a hard, and so a lot of words just didn't come out or couldn't be made. Um, but she was understanding what I was giving, just not as able to produce. And there might then transition to some impulse control and some initiating and sequencing issues, which are more of a prefrontal cortex problem. 
So that temporal lobes here and the frontal here. So that's that frontal temporal that we've been talking about. And then the other temporal lobe that she demonstrated is fluent aphasia. So that rhythm of speech is there, but the words don't necessarily fit what you want them to to make sense in a sentence. Um, and so it can sound like I have really good speech still and my language is still really positive and I'm really moving things forward, but the meaning behind it is a little bit foggy for the listener. So now as care providers, as a team, talk about what's frustrating about that. Because I'm not physic that physically impaired. I could take her outside and show her the car or show her what I want her to do. What's, what's frustrating or hard from a care support perspective that I don't think of doing? Well, the primary caregiver has got to be a detective and try to help you express or convey what it is that you need. Did Manda ask, Tipa, could you show me, can you take me and show me the car? Can you go show me the car? Right. Because I had receptive language. Right. What I can't do is switch the gear. And it's such a simple thing. And yet, if Manda doesn't know that part of my condition now is that I can't do the gear shift, we're both stuck. So learning that new skill of being the one that initiates, that switches me from words that I can't get to show, which I might be able to do, and it's not show with motions, because I... It's the, I'm not specific enough because I have to do it to get you to see it because I can't quite get all the bits and pieces to come together in my brain. And so unlike some people, I'm still trying. One of the really frustrating things for people who are in this condition is after a while, if they don't have a responsive team present. Right. Right. I give up because I, I don't have a lot of strategies that'll work for me and I become a shadow. So somebody who's a great example, if you ever want to go and watch some of the work that Susan, spell Susan's last name for me, Lauren, because you're better at her. Sushan, S-U-C-H-A-N, Sushan. Su no, thank you. Susan Sushan um, did she did she's a huge advocate for people with frontal temporal particularly with primary progressive aphasia because she had horrible aphasia and she'd had problems with m movement things to get things to happen but she was very effective at working with her family to try to help them better support her by getting them to give her the right cues that she could then use to get where she needed to go and what she was able to do is gradually get a little bit better at using language because she was getting the right support. And even though the wiring was really damaged, she came back from not having much speech at all to having some decent amount of speech further into the disease as she quit being so anxious about not having adequate speech. Mm. Because part of what was blocking her language wasn't the actual destruction of the wiring it was anxiety about not being able to talk like she used to be able to, not being able to express like she, and when she finally just, well, it's, it's different. And she had a different affected speech, but she was actually quite effective until mm -hmm. she died at being able to share with people what she needed to share with people. Let's call Susan's story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So she was someone who initially, Larry, Lauren, when uh, Susan first got diagnosed, can you, can, can you share a little bit about what kind of some of the things were when she first got diagnosed? I'm not even sure I remember a lot. I know that they went through a lot of psych diagnoses. Um, she had a lot of emotional distress yeah. because she was a brilliant lady who was having a lot of trouble not being able to express what she wanted to express and her family was having a lot of trouble because they couldn't figure out how to be helpful. 
So the point of these examples that I'm given is they're non-traditional dementias. And I'm spending more time on the non-traditionals because that's where people tend to think they're rare. And in fact, they're, they're more common than people realize because we totally miss them. And people may never get a chance to really live with dementia because what ends up happening is we place them in situations where now they're living with severe disability because of what we've done to intervene to try to manage behaviors. And the reason we are managing behaviors is because we misunderstood what the first symptoms were. So now we'll step back and I'll take you back to another place because we just have time for maybe one more role play. And again, all this stuff is in a PowerPoint with all the details. The point of our interactions in these, um, my point in running these webinars this way is to get us to work in a team format where we start to problem solve. We start to get curious and strategize. And we start to get smarter about really recognizing one of the members of our team could be the person living with dementia themselves. Um, who is frequently able to give us some information, but maybe not in a traditional way. So if we develop the skills we need, we can be more effective at being the detective that works with them to try to problem solve through this rather than jumping to conclusions. So, all right, Mandy, you ready for one more? Yep. So listen, I want to know when it is that we're going on that vacation. So you're wanting to know when we're going on a vacation. Yeah, it's in May or something, isn't it? Yeah, it's May, uh, I think it's the 7th through the 9th. The 7th and, th and where is it? Because I, I know you probably said, but I can't seem to, um, and I'm supposed to keep up with somebody on the vacation when you're vacant you're doing something and i'm doing something we're going to new york you guys new are going to meet us there oh so it's yeah. new york yeah oh well when did you decide on new york well we we did that together tipa we huh so because so, we used to live there and you guys were gonna yeah, yeah, come meet yeah, us i there. know you live there so when did when did that i thought you guys were deciding on it well, yeah, we were, but then you said that New York sounded great, especially in May. Yeah. Um, oh, it's in May so then? What, what's the date in May? May 7th through 9th. Oh, well, that, I'll be there for my birthday then. Right. That was the point. Yeah. Oh, oh, so part of it is birthday. Yeah. It's a vacation. We were going to do it together. And oh, well, that's good. Yeah, so I, what am I watching, though? There's something about watching something. I you're watching, yeah, you're watching the kids for the afternoon. Oh, yeah, so what are you going to do while we're watching the kids? Is Dick coming? Well, I think so. Um, oh, okay. You said so that I, he was going to. Well, did you make reservations? Well, we ha well, I don't think we've done that yet. It's only January. Oh, okay, and this is for when? It's for May. May? Oh, my birthday. Yes. Okay, so we're going to go to to New Jersey. Was it New Jersey or New York? New York. Well, why are you getting so... Well, I'm just, ta you know, we've, we've talked about it so many times. Well, I'm I know we have. I'm just, I just asked a question. I mean, I don't know. I'm sorry. Right. If I'm I'm, no, I'm sorry. I should have, I should have written okay, it down pause. for you. Okay, anybody want to talk about this one? It's like Alzheimer's to me. Yeah. <laughs> so give me, are you, what, what was the classic sort of giveaway of probably, yeah, there's a, there's a possibility. I'm sure term memory. And yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now, does it seem like I have some awareness or no awareness of my change? A little bit. Mm -hmm. When you say that, tell me more, Georgina. What, what, what made you think a little bit? Uh, you just backed off. You, you said, yeah, I know. I know we've talked about it a lot, but then you got a little, I'm just asking. So yeah, I can tell. And you were yeah. looping. And too. I was looping because I, 
I really am trying to hold on to things and I am, what am I holding on to? Because that's that, that's that amygdala thing. The amygdala is pushing me to hold on to things, mm -hmm. but my hippocampus dying is causing me to lose things. But my amygdala wants me to hold on to things, mm -hmm. but my hippocampus can't quite get it. I think you're just actually excited about the trip. You just I can't am. hold on to the details. Yeah, I'm really excited about the trip. And are there reasons why I should be excited about the trip? It's it's your birthday. It's my birthday. I'm going to get <laughs> to take gonna be together. grandkids. We're going to go to a place where they used to live. And so there's a lot of stuff right. that's going to be unfamiliar and it's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's fairly overwhelming to my brain. And so my brain, every time it goes to think about it, what happens to the amygdala? It worries. I've got the threat pleasure thing going on uh -huh. where I'm threatened by it at the same time I'm looking. And so because the amygdala is active, what's happening to my ability to retain anything? Right. And the conversation is looping because my language comprehension is dropping and my prefrontal is shutting off with the heightened both combination of distress and excitement. Right. And what's happening when I look at Amanda? You're getting pissed. <laughs> well, she's Kinda. looking pissed. I mean, so yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing something wrong. I know this isn't good. Right. And I'm, now what am I anxious about? What's my next anxiety? That Amanda's going to think something's wrong with you. And not want what? Not want to take you? Ah, not want to have me watch the grandchildren. Right. Not want this to be a big thing. Not want, you know, so all of a sudden now I've got new anxiety. Because right. the last thing I want to do is upset her. Because if I upset her, then maybe we won't do this. And now, now, now what am I going to do? So maybe I shouldn't talk to Amanda about this anymore. But now what will happen to this distress and anxiety if I don't feel comfortable going to Amanda and getting this information? You hold it in and yeah, become withdrawn. So what happens to my ability to function day to day? It declines. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and, and it all started with Amanda getting a little snippy, mm -hmm. not meaning to, but just not realizing what she's dealing with is the early sign of a condition that I can't hold on to things. Yeah. So she didn't take the initiative to take the stress and the threat away from me. All she was doing was answering my questions, but she wasn't doing the high energy and it's like, you know what? She doesn't have a strategy for that. And due to the lack of strategy, my early signal and symptom will actually cause it to look much worse and need a function worse than I need to. Right. Because she hasn't built a skill set because nobody has helped her identify what she's looking at is dementia and it's Alzheimer's and we need new strategies. So, I'm going to pause here because you can look at the PowerPoint and you can read through those things. I want to use the last minute or two to see if folks have any more questions about the different dementias. Because we could spend time talking about, there's 120 variations in forms and causes and such. So if you have interest in learning more about those different dementias and doing some, info, some more information seeking or sharing of that, we have Ask Tipa Anything on Wednesday nights uh, once a month, and I'd be happy to respond and share more about any of the dementias that are around. My point of today was to get us to think in team set about we see symptoms, but we don't know exactly what's going on, and we don't always take the time we could and should to figure out the symptoms, what the possibles might be, and what to do about it even before we go seek medical advice. Because we need to have a better handle on all the symptoms before we start sharing information. Otherwise, people hear the first words are out of our mouth 
and we emphasize that thing we saw and then suddenly people are suggesting medications and interventions and mm -hmm. diagnoses before we explore a little more fully from the perspective of the person living with the condition what's working what isn't working and what might help right. so any any other thoughts or ideas people want to share out with the group before we before we call it a day isn't it oftentimes though deeper that it's it's mixed i mean it's are there it dementias is. that are completely pure when you see them in the early signals and signs that's when you're likely to see your pure dementia so that's why I wanted to play these out because early in the disease, it actually is unusual to have two occurring at the same time exactly. Mm -hmm. What will happen is one starts and the abnormal proteins that start happening seem to trigger that onset of the second. Oh. And so by the time we're in the middle of the disease, they're blending and mishing and matching. But early on, most individuals develop a single dementia first Ooh. that increases the risk of other dementias starting to jump up and become part of the party. So by mid-disease to late disease, most people have more than one active dementia, it turns out. But mm -hmm. early on, we see more pure symptoms. The problem is we miss them because we weren't even seeing them. So we are down to our last question. So you got to see a little demo of Alzheimer's as well, a little more traditional um, from what a lot of people know what to look for. Uh, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about question number four now. What can we do to help? So she mentioned quite a few things throughout the entirety of this webinar. But number one, first and foremost, build a team. Don't try to go this alone. This is not an individual journey because when there's one person living with dementia, everyone around them is also living with dementia because if we accept it and embrace it, then we're choosing to be a part of this journey with them. And so the idea of having one person who's there for a big picture view to pull back and say, hey, let's look at all the meds that are being given here and let's look at some side effects. And has this one been working or should we get rid of that one? And what else is going on? Do they have a history of depression? Is there something else that we want to be aware of? So you have one person who, at least one person, who's that big picture view. And then you've got one person or more who do some digging into the details. And those might be the professionals that you're working with, doctors, um, professional care partners, or it might be family members, depending on your role and, and what, that, what we're digging into, which of the details we're digging into. Building a team, most important. Validating someone's words or actions. If they say they're looking for a little boy that you don't see, you repeat the words, oh, you're looking for a little boy. Huh, I'm not seeing that. So it's really hard to get ourselves to reflect back some of the language we're given, but if I've got something like primary progressive aphasia, where I'm giving you what I've got, by providing just those words back to me, you're validating what I've, I've offered up and what I have still to give. Um, the third one that she mentioned is using cues. Cues like, tell me more about that. Instead of, oh, I'm not sure that makes sense. Tell me more about that because maybe the word isn't there, but you know what you mean. And you just need that cue to tell me more about it. Or if I'm struggling with words, Show me what you do with it. Show me what you want. Show me what you're thinking. Show me that thing that you're trying to describe. Can you show me what you do with it? Because if you can, then I might be able to pick up on that cue a little bit quicker. And finally, one that she mentioned or sort of offered or showed is offering choices. Instead of offering a yes or no, try offering is it more this or is it more that? Is it this or is it something else? So that idea of offering choices to people and just sticking to two, that you're okay with both options, a great strategy that can help. Finally, number four, get used to saying I'm sorry and meaning it, even if you did nothing wrong, because this thing called dementia is tough and we're gonna make a lot of mistakes while we try to navigate through. And so just being ready and willing to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happened. That shouldn't have happened. Or I'm sorry. This is really hard. 
can go a long way. So thanks for joining us. It's been a really fun webinar. Hopefully you've learned a lot. And I'll make sure that you have all four of these questions answered in a PowerPoint that you can get at the end of this. So thanks guys, we'll see you later.